Good evening, folks. This is the main prepper. Tonight I want to talk about Sit Rep New York. I want to talk about what happened and let's learn some lessons from what has happened during this hurricane so that we can learn and better prepare for the future. Welcome to those of you that are new and if you haven't had a chance, there's a video I put up yesterday uh, and here's a link to it and it's basically an introduction to preparedness. Some folks uh, needed to hear this from their friends and or from somebody that would give them a better explanation because I know when you come out here and look on YouTube, it can get rather overwhelming. Even just coming to my channel, there are so many videos you don't know where to start. So that's a good one to start with and I recommend that. <clears throat> Afterwards, have a look around, enjoy yourself. While you're here at the channel, uh, consider yourself to be like a guest in the home. Have a cup of coffee, take off your shoes, have a seat, enjoy yourself, make yourself comfortable. Here on this channel, uh, we're committed to sane and logical discussion about things. You don't hear us talking about politics. You don't hear us talking about uh, anti-government things. If I do talk about it, it's to encourage people to not be that way. Instead of teaching people to be afraid, I teach people to actually have confidence and courage and joy about the future. So here our preparedness model is going to be about thriving, not just surviving. And uh, concurrent with that is my friend David with Southern Prepper One, uh, the Haas USMC and others who have a similar view. This is not about fear and paranoia, about hiding under the bed and waiting until we get gobbled up. Rather, this is about acknowledging the fact that a disaster may occur in our life, that problems will happen. And the better prepared we are, the less suffering we're going to do. Not only we, but our neighbors and friends as well. On that note, I'm committed here to teaching us to have a sense of community, that is to incorporating our neighbors into our plans. I don't mean buying them their own food and taking care of all of their needs. I rather mean encouraging them to join us in preparing. In order to do that, we need to be somewhat sane in our delivery of things, and I believe the majority of you are. My subscribers, those of you that I have spoken with in PMs and offline and met in person, are very normal, salt-of-the-earth kind of people. Uh, unfortunately, the crazy ones seem to get all of the attention, and that's a sad thing because it's misrepresenting the rest of us. But that's all right. We'll just keep being what we know is right. We'll keep doing the right thing. And eventually, uh, the truth will come out. And people will say, you know what? Those preppers are actually pretty normal, sane, and kind of sensible people. In fact, I think that if there were more preppers in the storm uh, path in the New York and other areas, we would see a lot less uh, problems and more importantly, I think the recovery would have went a lot quicker. Uh, people that are looking ahead and looking around tend to be less of a burden on the world around them. It's been my experience. And so this is a rather uh, good mindset to have. Whether you believe in only having a couple of weeks worth of food and supplies, or whether you're like me, you want a long-term, sustainable, self-sufficient lifestyle. I like that lifestyle because it's not just surviving. It's thriving. It's a beautiful way to live, uh, to raise your own food, to have fresh food every day, to not have to worry, to have peace and joy, uh, to look out there and if you see the economy going bad, go, oh, that's not good. But you know what? Uh, we have our bills paid. We have saved our money up a little bit. Or if we haven't done that, we at least have a year's supply of food put back and we can pay some bills and we can eat. And it may not be as good as we wanted, but it won't be as bad as it could be. All right, enough introduction and orientation. Let's talk about New York and what's going on. Now, I've been reading a lot of news reports, but better yet, I'm getting reports from subscribers who are in the affected area, and they're giving me some very good insight. And I'm also vetting this. And no offense, uh, if you're a friend or a subscriber, I always check uh, sources and information because I have a responsibility. I have several thousand subs uh, that are listening to me, and I have a responsibility to make sure. You may have absolutely told me the truth, but it may have been only from a very uh, limited anecdotal perspective. So what I do is I go out and I vet these things, uh, not to find out if you're telling me the truth, but rather to see how widespread uh, the things are that you saw. Because I know when I'm looking uh, out the window of my uh, armored fighting vehicle, uh, my home V, I only see out of this little window and that window, and that's all I can see. So I need to ask the turret gunner, hey, uh, what's over there at uh, 9 o'clock? And he can swivel over there and have a look and say, oh my God, or nothing. 
Okay, so the first uh, report that I read was kind of uh, amusing, but in a not so nice way. The Entitled, and I have a video up called uh, Threats to Preppers, The Entitled, and there was one woman who lived in a very nice neighborhood. The homes were all a million dollar and up. I don't know if that's expensive in New York or if that's a cracker box, who knows? But it sounded kind of pricey to me. Uh, relatively speaking, the price of a million dollar home is far less than a generator. And that's the issue, the lady said. Uh, they're taking generators down into the poor neighborhoods. Why aren't they bringing some up here? And I thought, oh, you poor thing. Uh, take the silver spoon out of your mouth and go down and buy your own. How about that? Well, she couldn't do it right away because uh, there were none for sale. But the point being, why didn't she do so earlier? Goodness gracious. Well, that would have made her a crazy prepper to go down and buy a generator. And now, guess what? She has no electricity. She has cut her nose off to spite her own face. And all she can do is uh, uh, sneer at the people who got generators brought down into the poor neighborhoods. And I don't uh, begrudge them. Uh, some folks that are poor, they don't have $20 between 30 of them. Uh, they're that poor, and so they are not going to be able to go out and buy a generator, much less a bunch of gas for one. And uh, that's fine that that happened. Uh, you can say, well, you know, uh, too bad for them. I don't. Uh, I think that's a viable function uh, of our government, at least our power company, you should have bring the generators down there. After all, they have a responsibility uh, to provide electrical power to their customers. And that's kind of what happened. Uh, we saw there was a failure in that. We'll talk about that in a moment. So, the entitled, uh, that mentality is out there, and people will label us as preppers. Uh, one guy was saying, y'all are, are elitists. And I said, really? Yeah, he said, yes. He said, because uh, when people show up at your door, you're not going to feed them. And I said, okay, uh, so if you show up at my door, I'm supposed to feed you. Yes, because uh, you have food, and I don't have any. I said, well, why don't you have any food? Well, yeah, I said, because you didn't buy any, right? Because you didn't prepare. That's why you don't have any food. Uh, say it. Say it. That's the truth. Well, yeah, okay, that's the truth. You didn't buy any food. You didn't prepare. So that's why you don't have anything. How hard would it be for you to go down there and buy food? Well, you know, I don't have a lot of money. Well, neither do I. Uh, neither do most of us that are preparing. And yet we're making sacrifices. I guarantee if I look into your finances, I'll see that you're spending money on something you don't need to spend it on. And if you tell me that's an excuse and I'm supposed to come and take care of you, I believe that makes you the elitist in this conversation, not me. So don't let people uh, browbeat you uh, with their manipulative nonsense. You're not being an elitist. You're a practical individual. Uh, you're salt of the earth, by golly. Uh, don't listen to that nonsense. They're, uh, they're just guilt manipulators. Looting was occurring. Uh, people's homes were getting broken into, and usually it was soft uh, looting. That is, they were just coming in and sneaking around, and if they thought the house was unoccupied, they'd break in and take things. So it didn't get on the level of people kicking doors down and killing folks. However, uh, there were people that were homeowners that put up signs that said, looters will be shot. Uh, I thought, good for you. I hope you have a good scope, uh, and you shoot straight and well, and you have a high-powered rifle. If you catch somebody looting, uh, that's the lowest of the low out there stealing from people uh, in the midst of a disaster. Uh, having said that, if somebody's hungry and they're looking for food, don't shoot them. Uh, my goodness, that's crazy. And yet uh, sometimes people will have to go out, and that'll bring up another point here in a second. Uh, and that's about not going outside uh, during a disaster, but we'll get to that in a sec. Okay, so looting was occurring. The worst kind of looting appears to be, and many people told me this, their subscribers, uh, the scumbags were coming around and they'd come by with what's called an Oklahoma credit card. Yeah, it's a length of garden hose and you stick it down in the gas tank and you suck the gas out and you siphon some into your bucket or all of it. Well, if you had a locking gas cap, that's a pretty smart idea. So they would just take a screwdriver and punch a hole in the bottom of your gas tank and dump the gas into, your, um, into a five gallon bucket. What happens when the bucket's full? Uh, well, they just take the bucket and leave. Uh, well, wait a minute, the gas keeps running out. Not their problem. Uh, now your car not only has a hole in the gas tank, it's not mobile, you also have a gas leak on the ground. And if they've been hitting all the cars on the street, you could have a potentially uh, hazardous situation to the entire neighborhood. Gasoline, when it's vaporized, is extremely volatile. You can vaporize gasoline in the air and it'll flatten an entire city block. Uh, it's nasty. You don't want to mess with vaporized gas. And that's exactly what happens when you punch a hole in a gas tank and all the gas runs out but the fumes uh, linger. There's no electricity. 
for some neighborhoods, 200,000 people uh, after 13 days still had no electricity. 200,000 people with no electricity, that means no heat. You say, no, you can turn your heater on, uh, the oil heater in the basement. Well, yes, the heater will come on and the boiler will uh, turn on. However, the pumps don't circulate without electricity. The fans that blow the hot air off the furnace don't circulate without electricity. So, not going to work. You're going to have to do without electricity. And some people actually have some food and water put back and then they discover, uh, yes, they even have a manual can opener. Okay? But uh, they don't have any way to cook the food because the stove is electric. So they were in trouble too because uh, they had to eat cold food. And that's okay. That's better than no food. Uh, but sometimes it uh, gets a little old. There were other shortages as well. And that always happens when you don't have electricity. Your grid is down. Uh, you have blocked streets. Some of the blockage on the street was because the power company wasn't getting in there and doing preventive maintenance uh, to the trees and the shrubbery that grows up over the power lines. And this happens, they were doing a uh, as we need it type of a maintenance. That's an inexpensive way to do it, uh, as long as you don't have an accident, a disaster, an ice storm, or a hurricane, such as we saw. When that happens, then all these trees blow down on top of the power lines, and now you got an expensive problem. So it's a calculated risk, and it failed. I saw this happen in Conroe, Texas, and we were without power for two weeks because they hadn't trimmed back the uh, trees from the power lines, all right? So when this happens, uh, your power is going to be out. But more than that, uh, you also got trees in the street and you've got people's cars that are running out of fuel in the street. You've got traffic lights that aren't working and you have chaos. So it's a disruption to the resupply system. That being said, because it was a relatively small area, relatively speaking, uh, to the rest of the nation, it was not uh, as bad as it could have been. Had this occurred across a wider swath, let's say the entire nation, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency, as well as other relief organizations, have a finite amount of resources and personnel, and their strength is in their ability to focus and concentrate all of those on the targeted area. When it happens across too widespread an area, we hit a tipping point and we're no longer able to effectively do anything. Massing your forces at the point of attack is the military concept, and if you have you know, too long and uh, thin a line to defend or to cover, or a bunch of things you're taking care of all at once, you're going to be ineffective. Fortunately, we didn't have that, so they were able to, on the federal and state level, take care of things and get the job done. However, uh, that brings up a good point. FEMA is not all-powerful. And uh, they can't do everything all at once. They were doing what they could, but some people have a mistaken idea of what FEMA is there for. Uh, some people have a very paranoid idea that FEMA exists uh, solely to uh, build FEMA camps so that we can march all the patriots off and kill them after we convert their children to Islam. Uh, that makes no sense. There's no credible proof to back that up. And that's quite paranoid uh, to even believe that. Other people believe uh, that FEMA exists uh, so that it can fix everything, so that uh, if they get up in the morning, there's been a hurricane, FEMA is going to show up, and a FEMA utility man will come uh, parachuting in out of the sky, and he'll turn your electricity back on for you. Uh, it's not accurate either. Uh, they have a finite role and a set specific one, and now in New Orleans they messed up uh, because they had a political appointee in charge, uh, and he was ineffective, and they should have appointed from within. The people from within know what they're doing. However, they can't do everything. Thing. And this is where it's important for you to be a prepper. That's right, uh, to be a prepper. Well, no, wait a minute. If you're a prepper, the government's going to want to kill you. They want to find where you live and take you to a FEMA death camp and convert your children to Islam and kill you and take your supplies. Actually, they don't. What FEMA wants to do is do its job. And the fewer of us that show up at a FEMA camp uh, asking for help, uh, the more we're going to be able to concentrate on the real problems, which is to get the infrastructure back up on its feet. FEMA, in fact, the entire federal government uh, is organized and committed uh, to get status quo back. That means get the lights back on, get normalcy going, people back to work, uh, production, taxes being paid. All of those things are necessary adjuncts and parts of their implied mission, their implied uh, uh, overall reason for being. Uh, not to come and turn your personal electricity on and fill sandbags in your front yard and hold your hand and rub your belly. And fortunately, some people see that. That's a good point to bring up this. Uh, FEMA is not all powerful. They don't have this massive number of people. There are not hundreds of thousands of people, uh, men in black, waiting to come and rescue you and rub you on the belly and tell you uh, everything's going to be wonderful. 
Nor does the U.S. government have that kind of power, uh, authority, and scope. There are not hundreds of millions of federal employees waiting to come in uh, and steal your freedom from you. That's not the case. Is it possible uh, that a government could get out of control and have that as an agenda? Absolutely, and it's happened throughout history, and we're wise to be very careful uh, about who we elect and also to hold our public servants accountable. And notice I said the word public servant. Uh, those of us who work for the government, including yours truly, uh, are public servants. I'm not speaking as a public servant right now. I'm just speaking as a citizen. However, a uh, public servant is what people are that work for the government. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to come over and wash your car and trim your nails. What it does mean is that I'm here uh, with a specific left and right limit on my mission, uh, my authority, and everything else. And that's the same thing without uh, and throughout the government. So we're right to hold the government accountable uh, for things it does. We're right when they do something that's suspicious to go, hey, explain yourself. And guess what? Uh, you are citizens, not subjects. Uh, we are citizens, not subjects. You are not ruled uh, by the government. The government, uh, everyone, we're all ruled by the law. It's called rule of law, and we follow the laws. And if you're breaking the laws, the government will come there and exercise due authority uh, to make you uh, follow them. But by and large, uh, the government doesn't get to be a law unto itself. Okay, what if everybody in the path of this storm was prepared? If everybody in the path of this storm was prepared, they would have done the number one rule that Maine Prepper has for you. And this is my rule of thumb uh, for you to keep in mind. Your objective and your goal in every emergency is to stay home. That's right. Stay off the streets. If you're not home, uh, bug out plan. Get home. Uh, if you are at home, stay there. Don't go out. No, don't do it. Stop. Or resist the urge, the, uh, the curiosity. That's why I say get a radio, get a shortwave radio, get all this stuff so you can listen and get information. Now, it may be necessary. You need to go check on Grandma. Okay, got it. That's a necessity. But if you're curious, uh, that's a bad idea. Worse than that, you've run out of stuff that you could have put back. Now you got to go out and try to find some. Guess what? You and 100 million other people are out there at the same time uh, doing the same thing. And now you're in trouble because guess what? Uh, street A, everything's happy and fine and the neighbors are all helping each other. Children have lemonade stands. Uh, puppies are playing. There's rainbows and unicorns. You go around the corner and it's Bosnia or uh, Serbia and there's gunfight going on. Or there's people with uh, screwdrivers poking holes in gas tanks on cars and all kinds of craziness happening. So you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, it's not like uh, everything is safe and wonderful. So, uh, rule, stay at home. The stay at home rule is in effect. Uh, if there's a disaster, stay at home, turn on the radio, and stay off the street. You're in the way. You're causing trouble. Those of us that are trying to do disaster relief, uh, we need to focus on the ones that really have problems. If you have a problem, come for us. We'll help you. But if you don't have a problem, stay away. You're just getting underfoot. Uh, sorry to be so crude about it, uh, but we're not here to babysit you. We're here to fix the problem. So go home. Get off the street. Go away. Okay. That's, uh, I can't say it any better than that. Hopefully you understood what I'm saying. Stay at home, right? What did I say? <laughs> Thank you, stay at home. Okay, so the way, uh, the way that you can help is to be prepared. And this is why I don't understand where people are so paranoid about preparedness. Uh, people ought to all embrace this, especially after this hurricane, and say, wow, this is a good idea. Uh, I can have all this stuff at home. I don't have to go stand in line, because that sucked to go down there and stand in line for three hours to get a jug of water. Uh, man, I could have just kept water in the pantry. Uh, wow, what a mess. Okay. So this is a way, uh, by being prepared, we mitigate this. Now there's a three-day model out there of preparedness that the government puts out. It's some goofy, happy face uh, thing. I've got one of these disaster preparedness uh, booklets, and they're useless to me, uh, except for a reference point to say that they don't understand that usually everybody's got three days worth of stuff. Even when I was in college, I probably had three days worth of old pizza in the bottom of the icebox. Everybody's got three days worth of stuff in the house. That's not asking a whole lot. And they're trying to be real safe because they don't want panic here. And everybody wants to come across like they're oh so above it all. Oh, uh, that preparedness stuff. I'm not into that. Uh, I have a very sensible amount of food. Really? So if you have three days of food and the disaster lasts 30 days, how sensible was that? Huh? Uh, I didn't think you'd say anything but, gee, not, I hope. 
So if you've got three days supply of food, the chances of uh, uh, you can hold your breath for three days, my goodness, that's nothing, it's silly. I want you to shoot for more than that. Try for 30 if you don't have anything. Make 30 your goal. If you can't get to 30, go for at least a week. And that includes everything, food, water, medicine, everything you need. Just write down a list of everything you use in a week, okay? Everything that you use and need, whether it's electricity, whether it's water, whatever you use, I want you to make a list of all the stuff that you use in a week and detail it. Here's how, much, here's how many cans of beans I ate. Here's how much coffee I drank. And make a list for everybody in the house. And then figure out what that is and make sure that includes medicine and that includes a first aid kit and a bunch of other stuff that you're not going to have. Flashlights and batteries, candles, all of these things. Make sure that you have enough for a whole week. That's a lot of stuff, okay? After that, you got the hang of it, right? Now we know how to shop. Now we know how to buy. Uh, 30 days. You say, well, that's a lot to do. Really? Try doing that after the lights go out and there's six million people running around in the city trying to do the same thing. See if you get a fair price then. You won't. So listen to me, please. Uh, do it now. 30 days minimum. 90 days is a real good benchmark to have uh, for everything. And uh, most people that are preppers and have been doing it a while uh, will say that's a really good one to have. And that's very reasonable. And there's some things that happen that do run into 90 day windows. And that's good. So try 90 days. For myself, I have a different goal, and that's longer than that. I've got the 90 days and then some. In many cases, I've got a year's supply of some things put back. But more importantly that, long term, and part of long term is community. I'm trying to get my neighbors involved so that when things do happen, we're all working together. Oh sure, not everybody will have a generator, but those of us that do, we can run a power line over to help our neighbors out. Not everybody's gonna have this or that. We'll help each other out a little bit, but everybody should have at least some of the basics put back. Now for myself, long term means a self-sufficient, sustainable lifestyle. Very similar to what you'll see a lot of people doing, calling it voluntary simplicity. And that's something that we should do. In addition to our supplies, I've also got the ability to sustain things for a long period of time. That means to be able to grow my own food and raise my own food. I love doing those things. That is a blessed way to live. That is a joyous way to live, to get up and to be able to have fresh food from your own garden, to go out to the chicken coop and get eggs. These things are a tremendous joy to me. Now, you may not have that opportunity. Uh, you live in the city. But even people in the suburbs in the city will tell you it's entirely possible. Uh, go look for the DeVries family. They have a wonderful uh, set of videos up here. In fact, uh, there. Go and have a look at their channel. They have a tiny little plot of land and they raise all their own food there. Uh, it's amazing what they've done with so little. So much can be done. Okay, folks, so the lesson is, if nothing else, if you remember, make your goal to be able to stay at home during a disaster so that you don't have to get out there. You're endangering yourself. You're making it more difficult for the people that are trying to help. And you're really not doing anything for yourself or your family by being out in public uh, after the disaster. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to be prepared in advance uh, to take the steps now while it's possible and while it's inexpensive. Uh, and whether you believe it's just going to be another hurricane coming down the alley at you or whether you believe it's going to be something a bit more substantial as I and several others do, such as a serious economic collapse. Whether you believe any of those scenarios, all of them, or something far more dire, it is prudent. I think it is necessary that everybody, everybody out there in this country and indeed in the world, uh, start looking at the notion that everything's not going to be perfect and that problems and disasters do happen. And the best way to be able to mitigate the problems from that is to be prepared. Folks, uh, this has been the main prepper. And if I can leave you with one thing, make your goal to thrive, not just to survive. Thank you and have a good evening.